Right, let's uh, make a start, shall we? Okay. Okay, right. Um, today's uh, last. Today is our last class on uh, sources of capital, and the two uh, sets of uh, instruments or securities that we're going to look at are convertible notes or convertible bonds. That's um, one of it, and the other one would be a converting preferences. Okay. So as far as the uh, formula sheet is concerned, you know the one that I gave you at the beginning of uh, this workshop. These two expressions here that you that I'm pointing to. They apply to convertible notes. Okay, so these two are for convertible notes, and the very last expression here applies to converting preferences. So by doing these three expressions, we pretty much cover the entire formula sheet. But of course, this formula sheet is just for my half of the course. Okay, so uh, is this the two expressions here are for convertible convertible notes, and the last expression here is for converting preferences. Okay. Now, the, um, so the theme of uh, today's class, I guess, is to, um, um, I guess the major focus is to get a sense of the mechanics of those two types of instruments in terms of, okay, what is involved. Um, they are called hybrid securities, so what actually happens to them when they mature? So I guess that's, a, that's the key question. What happens to those instruments when they mature? With, you see, with ordinary shares, there's no maturity date, there's no expiration. So, so long as the firm continues to exist, the shares will keep on going. With uh, normal bonds, they do have a maturity date, but the outcome is very predictable. When it matures, the face value is paid back to the bondholders and the relationship ends there. But with uh, convertible notes, for example, you know, something else could happen. So I guess uh, part of the focus of working through the mechanics of those two instruments is to ask ourselves, okay, what happens at maturity? At time capital T. Okay, so that's one way of looking at it. And along the way, hopefully, you'll also try to um, get a sense of the following. Okay, why they appear to look and feel quite similar. Those two sets of instruments, convertible notes and converting preferences. It is quite easy to see the similarity. It is less easy to see the difference. So that's something that I would try to draw them out for you. And hopefully, uh, with the very last slide of today's workshop, I'll be able to sh show you the true, uh, shall we say, the true economic value of hybrid securities in terms of addressing this huge potential problem that exists between equity holders and debt holders. You may have heard of this thing called agency problem, normally the principal agent problem, but uh, very seldom we will hear a story about a potential problem between the two capital providers, equity holder and debt holders. And I'll tell you this, the problem is at least as serious as that of between principal and agent. So that's something that I hope to uh, share with you to, uh, towards the end of today's workshop. And if you can see the problem, you can also see why the, the economic value of hybrid securities as a means of uh, compromise between the two. Because it's neither this nor that. Okay, so that's the, uh, um, shall we say, the map for today's class. Okay, so some objectives. And indeed, uh, as I said last week, I've outlined a set of more specific uh, object, uh, learning objectives in the uh, study guide. Okay, so you can use that as a checklist. Okay, I know this, I know this, I know this. I should be fine. Things like that. Okay. Now, in terms of, um, um, so we'll start today's workshop by looking at convertible notes and convertible uh, bonds first. Um, so. We'll start with a very simple uh, distinction there. Th this, this word note and bond is uh, not that important as far as we are concerned. You see, we, if we are talking about fixed income markets, notes are normally used to describe uh, instruments that are less than a year. So 30 day bank accepted bill or bank accepted notes or 90 day, etc., etc. Whereas bonds are used to describe uh, debt instruments that are longer term, more than a year. 
So that's the distinction in fixed income markets. But for us, it doesn't really matter. We, I'll use them interchangeably, okay? So convertible notes, convertible bonds, as far as I'm concerned, they mean the same. They mean the same thing, okay? Now, it is a debt instrument that may eventually evolve into equity uh, at the maturity date. So maturity date is always uh, denoted with time capital T. So you see, in the past, when I draw lines with, uh, say, to describe a project, it's always time small t at the beginning and time capital T at the end. So capital T is always uh, there to represent maturity date. Okay? So the debt feature of a convertible note is that uh, it has, like a normal bond, it has regular periodic uh, interest repayments. And indeed, at maturity, the face value has to be repaid to um, um, note holders if they choose to. But of course, the, uh, the equity part of it comes in in terms of the following. In, at maturity, instead of saying, OK, I'll take back my face value, and everything ends there, you could instead, if you're the convertible note holder, you could say to the company, well, things seem to be going quite well. Please keep my face value. i like some shares, please. So instead of taking back cash in terms of face value, you say to the company, keep the face value. i like to instead take some shares in the company. So that's the part, that's the decision that a convertible note holder can decide. And that ability to choose is driven by this Warren feature. So Warren is something we discussed towards the end of last week's class. The ability to decide whether or not to choose one or the other. And you would only choose to uh, um, convert your note into shares if it's worth your while. Now, I did notice that uh, uh, depending on where you print this, you might have um, the notation as FV face value. I think that's uh, not that necessary here, so we, we just stick to that uh, same notation, X. Okay, so X is uh, some fixed amount, um, the same X that we use in, uh, uh, in last week's class where we say you can buy something at a predetermined price. So I think there's no need to have a different notation with face value. Okay? So the decision on whether or not you choose to redeem for the value of X or whether you choose to convert into shares is simply determined by if the shares that, you that is being converted into is larger than the value that you would get if you redeem, if this expression is greater than zero, then you would choose to convert. So that payoff is very similar to that of a call option, uh, or in this case, a warrant, okay, which is what we discussed last week. So that's what's basically driving it. Of course, uh, later on, we'll, we'll, more for we'll probably cover this uh, in detail soon enough, but the idea is that the Warren feature is what allows you to say, instead of receiving this, I'm giving up X, I'm giving up the face value, but instead I'm taking in shares in the company. Okay, so that's the idea. And I would choose to do this if the difference between this is actually greater than zero. Okay. Although convertible notes are debt instruments, but they do have a um, they do have a pretty uh, how, how to say it is possible that they, they actually turn into ordinary shares. So they are not really regarded as pure debt instruments. So because of that, they are ranked lower than other sorts of uh, borrowings or debt instruments um, in, in terms of being unsecured, and they are ranked lower in term, uh, in a bank's uh, sorry in a firm's balance sheet if things go wrong so if things go wrong then then they are less uh, prioritized in terms of getting what's left of the company basically okay so that's the uh, typical story with uh, um, convertible notes there are counter examples and i think i'll quickly share this uh, short story with you this will motivate this will further motivate the importance of convertible note okay so although this is a bit outdated but at that time when it happened it's a very sensational case you see, 10 years ago in Hong Kong, um, um, up in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Telecom is up for grabs. And at that time, it was a very big deal. Why? Because all the telcos in the region sees Hong Kong as a gateway into China. So that's why they say to themselves, if I'm, if I'm able to establish a presence in Hong Kong, that will give me a good ground and position to, actually, to eventually enter the China market. So that's what they are thinking, especially with uh, the telecommunication co uh, companies of countries with smaller populations. Because all they are thinking is, if, if, I, if I'm able to capture just 1 or 2% of China's population, that's the same as my population. <laughs> so that's the idea there. Like with Australia, um, you only need to capture 2.5% of China's population. So they are thinking the same thing. So this story actually involves quite a few countries. Now at that time, 
um, there are two uh, hot favorites to actually win. Now, running a distant second is uh, Richard Lee's uh, Pacific Century Cyber Works. Now, you might not have heard of that name before, but his dad is pretty famous. His dad owns the uh, Hutchison Group. So, Lei Ka Xing, Li Jia Chen's the uh, father. So, his uh, second son, uh, for whatever reason, says that, oh, it's a good idea to acquire Hong Kong Telecom. But you see, because it's a publicly listed company that has been around for less than five years, all the analysts at that time rank him as a second, a distant second favorite. The hot favorite to actually win Hong Kong Telecom is actually Singtel, Singapore Telecom. I mean, they've got the, an, an entire country's sovereign wealth fund behind them. But uh, when the dust settled, it was an upset win, and Singtel actually lost. Now, Singtel lost to uh, Pacific Century Cyberworks because they didn't anticipate that he's able to, Richard Lee is able to give such a huge a generous bid for Hong Kong Telecom. And the reason why he's able to do that is actually because of Telstra. You see, a deal was actually struck between him and Telstra, and the deal involves convertible notes. What basically happened is, okay, Telstra would lend Pacific Century Cyberworks a huge sum of money, specifically for the acquisition of Hong Kong Telecom. And in return, PCCW will issue Telstra a whole bunch of convertible notes. Now, those convertible notes are very special. Number one, if the acquisition deal falls through, then everything dissolves. So PCCW has to cough back the money back to Telstra. Because Telstra is not interested in an IT company. Telstra is only interested in Hong Kong Telecom. So if it doesn't acquire, then there's no point in doing the investment. Number two, they are secured. And number three, they're not just secured against PCCW assets. They're specifically secured against Hong Kong Telecom infrastructure assets. And number four, combined with the fact that they are actually convertible notes, this is what Telstra's thinking. And at that time, it was a beautiful play on their part. You see, post-acquisition, two things could possibly happen to PCCW. Number one, it collapsed under the huge debt burden. Now, if it collapsed, everything defaults. But then again, Telstra is fine with that because Telstra would end up owning Hong Kong Telecom assets. Now, if the, deal, if the acquisition is a success and if PCCW actually survives, what happens to those convertible notes? Telstra will convert them and become a substantial shareholder of PCCW, thereby gaining exposure to Hong Kong Telecom as well. So you see, either way, it's good for Telstra. And this would only be possible if it's a convertible note. It cannot be shares, it cannot be new shares, it cannot be rights issue, it cannot be bonds. It can only work if it's convertible note for, from Telstra's perspective. So that was the deal that was cut between those two. And of course, um, they end up winning the bid. Now, uh, but actually to finish off this story, uh, it's, it's not just the end actually for Telstra. Um, Singtel lost. Now you can imagine, if you're the senior management of Singtel, this is not just disappointing, it is bloody embarrassing. You know, you expected to win with the government behind you and you lost. Anybody guess what happened the next year? Uh, you might not be around long enough uh, at that time, but it's... No, uh, Singtel is not totally irrelevant to us here. Any name, a word? Optus. That's how Singtel ended up owning Optus. In 2001, Singtel went to this company called Cable Wireless. You see, before 2001, Optus is owned by this British telco called Cable and Wireless. And they gave Cable and Wireless an offer price they couldn't refuse. And they quickly sell Optus to uh, Singtel. You see, in that price, um, which everybody says is ridiculously uh, generous, but as far as Singtel is concerned, it is a very fair price to pay because they factor in a premium in that price, and the premium is called revenge. And ever since then, for the past nine years, Singtel has been giving a huge problem to Telstra, I tell you. Every time they get a chance to, they send a complaint to ACCC, and every time they can, they rally all the other telcos against Telstra. So that was this uh, story uh, that happened 10 years ago, but it had ramifications even to this day. And it's all because of a deal that actually works because of convertible notes. Okay, so that's uh, what caused it to happen. Hopefully by the very last slide, you get a better appreciation for why convertible notes can make things happen in highly leveraged situations. Okay, so but that's uh, towards the end. So I thought this is something that uh, is pretty uh, nice to share. Um, so let's go back to the uh, simple, the basic mechanics of how a convertible note actually works. I was at the annual general meeting at Telstra 10 years ago, and Oh my goodness, the, the poor CFO was trying to explain to the shareholders what a convertible note is because they were very concerned that he's lending all this money to some high-risk uh, maneuver and things like that. So, yeah. 
but uh, with a convertible note, these are all the notations, okay? Um, you see, because the, uh, if things were to happen, they would only happen at maturity, so the focus is on time capital T, okay? So in terms of a timeline, um, this is what happens. Um, number of n number of existing shares in the company, and at time capital T, the uh, diluted share price um, at maturity when the bond uh, when the notes are to be converted. So that's uh, SDT, and the value of the company is also at time capital T is just VT. Okay, so that's uh, the value of the company. That's the uh, diluted share price at terminal date. So that's um, the turn there. And of course, um, there's M convertible notes um, that we need to worry about as well. So that's M convertible notes. Uh, what else? Now, each convertible note has a face value of X. Okay? So the total amount of liability that a company is, could actually be facing in terms of having to pay out money if those notes are actually redeemed is simply the value of there's M convertible notes. If each has a face value of X, then the total amount that a company has to pay out would simply be M times X. Okay, so this is MX. So what that particular line is saying is that, okay, we, for the time being, we assume that there's no default risk. In other words, the worth of the company is such that it is able to satisfy all debt repayment obligations if that does occur. Okay, so VT is larger than MX. Okay, so MX is the total amount owned. Um, if the notes are to be redeemed, they'll be redeemed for the value of X for each note. Okay? Now, if it's converted, that, um, the, the bond value is the value if it's redeemed, so that's X. The conversion value is the value if it's converted, and that is uh, SDT. Okay, so that's SDT. And the value of SDT is uh, adjusted simply as the following. SDT is the value of the firm divided by M plus N. So let's talk a bit about this, okay? Although it's, it is a simple adjustment, but there's a bit that's going on with this uh, um, expression here in line with what we've uh, done in the past, okay? Now, first of all, you will notice that, okay, hang on. When we do uh, calculate diluted share price with rights issue, with private placement, and when warrants are exercised, it's always something being added to the top and something being added to the bottom. So why is it that for this expression, nothing's being added at the top? You see, with rights issue, new shares, subscription price. With private placement, new shares, discounted price. With warrants, new shares, exercise price, right price, X, etc., etc. But why is it that there's nothing happening at the top here? Well, the reason is because, you see, with convertible notes, the, uh, the timing between creation of new shares and the cash flow that's being absorbed or the capital that's being absorbed by the company is different. You see, as far as the convertible note is concerned, the amount that is being raised occurs when they are being issued at time small t. But new shares are not being created until time capital T. So that's why there's actually a delay, there's a discrepancy in the timing between the two. And so B capital T in a way captures everything that happened since this point in time. Okay, so that's why when new shares are being created, the uh, value of the firm at time capital T already has that in it, has the uh, capital that's being raised five years ago, for example. So that's why there's no need to do any more adjustment to the numerator. Okay? Whereas with rights issue, it's always two things happening at the same time, private placement, and even when warrants are exercised, you get the strike price and you give out new shares. Okay? So, but for this case, it's a bit different. Okay, so please uh, take note of that. So this is the, uh, also one of the um, expressions, oh sorry, in the formula sheet, VT, M plus N, okay? Um, we'll do a numerical example later on to show a more comprehensive case where it is not one for one. I thought that, at least for a start, it's much easier if we see things on a one-to-one -one basis. So if it's one-to-one, -one, then you know that, oh, okay, if it's a converted, then the value that I'll get is SDT. If it's redeemed, then the value I get is X. So what would cause me to decide between convert or redeem is just a comparison between SDT and X. So that's simple enough. But you, 
if you see the simple case on a one-to-one -one conversion, you can easily do the scaling if it's not one for one. If it's, for example, one for two, one for five, etc., etc. And later on, we'll look at a numerical example where it's, uh, I think, one for five. But just on this note here, you see, the adjustment here is just to recognize the total number of new shares that are being created. So in this case, if there are M um, convertible notes and if it's one for one, then simply there, there will be M new shares being created. But if I just change the details here slightly, if I say it's one for two, then what, what would you simply do with this adjustment? It's not a trick question. Anyone? If it's a one for two. Yeah, you simply write this as 2M. If it's 1 for 5, this is simply 5M. You, 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 you try not to read this as a formula. Just try to think that, okay, I'm trying to adjust for the diluted share price given I, I need to adjust the share price for the total number of new shares being created. If it's 1 for 1, then it's M for M. M notes to M shares. If it's 1 for 2, then it, it is M notes for 2M shares and so on and so forth. I don't want to give another formula just for that, okay? It becomes too uh, inefficient, okay? So keep note of that. And indeed, when we do the numerical example, I'll show you that soon enough, okay? So make note of those two points then. Now, in terms of um, um, figuring out what's going on, now the next few slides is to give you a sense of uh, how would we go about to value such a sort of comprehensive, a sort of package type of security. Uh, if, if they are eventually traded in secondary markets. Okay. Now again, uh, I've changed the uh, wording. Uh, I do apologize for last week. I, because you see to me, <laughs> buy long and holder, they mean the same thing in options. So I forgot that some of you might not know the word, what the word long means. So I've changed all the, to more to words that are more familiar. So buy, okay? Buy means long means holder, etc., etc. Short means sell means writer, but. Okay, if you buy a convertible note, we're trying to uh, get a sense of what does that actually mean in terms of its building blocks. You see, one of the uh, uh, valuation approaches in finance is for more comprehensive securities, if you can do one of two things. Number one, if you can break it into its building blocks and if there are established approaches and methodology to value each of those building blocks, then you can easily value this comprehensive security because it is just the sum of its parts. Okay, if you can break it up into its pieces, if there are established uh, approaches to price and value those pieces, then you can basically value this security. Okay, you're valuing it as the sum of its parts. Okay? So what really, if you're buying a convertible note, what is it that you're really buying? Okay, so let's uh, analyze this properly. Now we know that uh, based on the notations um, that we set up previously, at maturity, you either redeem, get X, or you convert, get SDT. So a, a meaningful comparison is to ask ourselves, okay, what happens if SDT is less than or equal to X, or if SDT is greater than X? Now, if it's uh, greater than X, I'll convert. I would always choose to get the larger value. If X is larger, I would get X. If SDT is larger, I would want to experience SDT. Okay? So this is uh, quite straightforward for the case of uh, a long position, uh, sorry, to, if I buy a convertible note, this is the payoff at capital T. I either get X or SDT. Now you compare this with, uh, this. these are the corresponding two building blocks of a convertible note, okay? And this slide will prove it. If you buy a plain uh, bond or a note with the face value of uh, X at maturity, you will get X. Regardless of whether X is less than or greater than SDT, you will get the face value, whatever the face value is. So it is X in both cases. Okay? Now with the warrant feature, if you hold on to a warrant, which is like a call option, if SDT is less than X, then you would choose to do nothing. Because you see, if you activate or if you exercise your warrant, that means that you're paying X for, some, uh, for the underlying asset. Now if the underlying asset is worth less than what you're paying for, then you will just raise your hands and walk away. You will not touch this uh, warrant at all. It's not worth your while. So that's why the uh, outcome is zero. You would choose to do nothing, zero. Okay? Now if the worth of the underlying asset is more than what you get to pay for it, if SDT is greater than X, then you will say, yes, I want to activate this warrant and buy the share. I pay $10, it's worth $12. Okay? So SDT minus X is a, is a payoff that's greater than zero. 
And if you were to add those two together, it's very straightforward. Okay, it's x plus 0 gives you x. x plus s dt minus x gives you s dt, which is exactly the same as the payoff of the convertible uh, node. So this uh, sim simple proof shows that, okay, if you're buying a convertible node, you're actually buying two things at the same time. You're buying a bond and you're buying a warrant. So in terms of valuation, well, if the payoffs are the same, then uh, using the same uh, axiom that I've discussed before with rights issue, then the, the value of the node is just the value of the bond plus the value of the warrant. Now the value of the bond is very simple. It's in bond pricing. Okay, uh, bond pricing is basically MPV analysis, um, you know, all those discounted cash flow. And indeed, in the uh, numerical example, we'll do a simple, uh, quick revision there. Okay, so bond pricing is very well established, so you can easily price the bond component. Now, the warrant component is also very well established, it's in option pricing. Now, but for sure, option pricing is not something that I, 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 I'm able to teach in this uh, course. Uh, if you want, I can show you what it looks like. Um, if you haven't seen it before, um, you see, op I can tell you this, okay, th this subject that I teach in trimester one actually does it, but there's a reason why we didn't offer it to third year students or master students. Um, option pricing has five levels. Um, the basic level, level one, the formula, the set of formula for level one, if you compare it with this formula sheet, and I mean the, the entire formula sheet here, the level one formula is a lot more complicated and deeper conceptually than this entire formula sheet. So that's why it, it is not something that I can teach in one workshop or even two or three workshops. Okay? So that's how difficult it actually is. I mean, in terms of calculation, you can just plug in numbers, but to actually understand it is not as easy. So that's why I, I'm not able to actually teach that in this course. But it is actually very well established. So if you're able to price those two, then you'll be able to price the convertible note in principle. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the two components. So let's look at a very simple uh, numerical example to try to get a better sense of the mechanics of a convertible notes. Okay, so this, in this example, I, I introduce a bit more things. So instead of a one for one, I make it one for five. So if you, can, if you have something for one for one and also one for five, then it, you, you cover basically all the possible scenarios. Okay, now uh, 200 million. Uh, is the capital that we're trying to raise, and we are doing that by issuing 2 million convertible notes. Okay, so the first thing you can think of is, okay, the face value of each note would have to be $100, because I'm trying to raise 200 million by issuing 2 million notes. So 200 divided by 2 is $100, so that's easy. Okay. Um, and the second thing to note is, uh, at time small t, I guess, so this at Um, the current value of the company, uh, it has 20 million shares outstanding, and the current price uh, that they're trading at is uh, $25. And if they are able to, uh, uh, if we assume that they are able to fully raise the uh, $200 million that they need, Okay, so the value of the firm um, is uh, 700 million. Okay, so current shares of uh, um, to, uh, current share price of 25 dollars for 20 million outstanding shares, plus uh, 200 million face value. Sorry, 200 million that they managed to raise by issuing the convertible notes will give them a total value of 700 million. Okay, so that's the initial starting um, setup. Let's uh, ask a f uh, do a few more calculations. So what would actually trigger a conversion? I guess that's the key question here. So you see, back to our comparison, okay, we've got two notations there. Number one, SDT, and the second one is X. So what is X? Now, if you were to think of it on a per share basis, then the value of X is actually 20. Why? For sure, each note is $100 face value. You could choose to either receive $100 or you could choose to instead receive five shares. So that means that if you're giving up $100, that means that the price, the conversion price would be $20 each share that you are choosing to give up. Okay? So you need to scale down the face value for the number of shares that is being created. So it's 100 divided by 5, giving you 20. Okay, so that's another number that you can uh, add on. Um, if all the notes are converted, what would SDT be? Now I did... Um, I was trying to simplify this example, so I didn't... 
You see, I could easily add in more details at the front to say, oh, at maturity, the current share price is some other number, but I didn't do that. So what I basically say is I assume that pretty much nothing happened during the five years. So the value of the firm um, at time capital T is still 700 million. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't change that value, but I can easily, I could have easily changed that value. Okay, so in this case, I didn't. So I, it, remains, it remains at 700 million. Okay, as uh, the, the B capital T remains at 700 million. That, that's just my assumption here because I don't want to throw in more numbers. So it's a 700 million divided by N plus M. Now, N is the number of existing shares, which is 20 million. That's easy enough because it's what the previous slide is saying. And I guess the only adjustment that we need to make is, uh, okay, it's uh, 2 million notes each node turning into five shares. So two times five gives you 10 million new shares, okay? So it is not M, M will be two million, but the total number of new shares being created is 10 million. It's two million each turning into five shares. So make sure that you don't make any careless mistake, okay? If it's one for five, it's uh, five M, which is 10 million, and so on and so forth, okay? So um, make note of this. And so the uh, diluted share price, or SDT, is 23.33. That's on a per share basis. So if you want to think of it as uh, in terms of the conversion value, because you see each node turns into five shares. So if each share is uh, eventually worth 23.33, the conversion value on a per node basis, because per node, each node turns into five shares, you just scale it up by five. So it is 116.65. Okay, so those are the set of numbers that correspond to this particular instrument. Now, it, it may, I, I don't know about you, but it, it, it may confuse some students who say, oh, if it's not one for one, then there seems to be two channels of looking at things. But you see, all you need to do is to just get a hold of it in one channel, and then you can scale it up for another channel if you need to. Okay, so I'll just quickly summarize all the numbers that are uh, at this point in time in terms of what's going on. Okay. You can, you can try to get a sense of the numbers either on a per share basis, because you see, you're trying to think in terms of, okay, redeem versus convert. You could either choose to look at things on a per share basis, or you can choose to look at things on a per note basis. It's just a scaling. Now, if it's one for one, then it doesn't really matter because it's the same. One share, one note. Okay, but if it's, say, for example, one for five, I guess one way of looking at it at the very beginning is to just choose one channel. If I choose to look at all this set of numbers on a per share basis in terms of making my decision or in terms of analyzing, okay, what are the numbers I need to comprehend to decide whether to redeem or convert? If you choose on a per share basis, then the two numbers that you need to compare are simply $20, which is the uh, per share conversion price versus $23.33. So those are the two number, numbers that you would compare. If it's on a per note basis, uh, quickly anyone, what would be the two sets of numbers? Or if you redeem per note, you'll simply get that? Yeah, that's right. The face value of each note, which is $100. Or if you choose to forego that, on a per note basis, each note turns into five shares, and the conversion value on a, on a per note basis will simply be? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So it, it might seem that there's all these numbers floating around, but if you group it this way, then it, it's quite clear. You, if you look at things on a per share basis, you're comparing $20, which is fixed, against $23.33, which is SDT. If you compare it on a, if you're looking at things on a note basis, it's 100 versus 116.65. And what can you say about the blue numbers against the black numbers? Yeah, it's just times five. <laughs> 20 times five gives you 100. 23.33 times five gives you this. 
So it, it, it's just a scaling. <laughs> okay? So all this appears to be quite uh, messy, but it's just scaling for the number of shares being converted. And like I said, if it's one for one, then there's no two sets of numbers, so it's multiplied by one. Okay, so try not to get mixed up with all these numbers floating around. You only need the, the key is to compare between either these two set of numbers or these two set of numbers. Okay, you don't have to do this or this or some other form. Okay, so sort of stick to that. Okay, so that's uh, uh, my first set of comments. And the rest of it to complete this example is to just, okay, uh, uh, we may not get a chance to price the warrant, but we can at least price the bond. Uh, and we've done more than enough to price the bond. Bond pricing is just the the price of the bond is just the present value of all future cash flows. Sounds familiar? Okay, MPV and all those calculations, okay? Now, that's less important, I mean, uh, to the extent that I've already given you the calculation, okay, so, so that's how confident I am that you can do it. But I'm more interested in the following. Even without me giving you the calculation or the answer, or even have a calculator, I look at this set of numbers, uh, the relevant set of details corresponding to the bond component, I can easily tell you, I can easily know that the price must be a number less than 100. Now, how would I know that? This is uh, one of the last chance we have to do a revision, so anyone? How would I even know that the answer must be a number less than 100? Um, I, I'm not, if I'm just discounting the face value back to zero, this will be a smaller number, that's for sure. But I'm not just discounting this back to zero. The, the bond is also giving me coupons. It's paying me coupons at a rate of 8%. In other words, it's giving me a coupon of $8 per year. What I'm saying is, I know that I'll get a number if I discount the present value of all these cash flows back to time zero, I will get a number. I'm asking the required, okay, the required rate of, uh, co the cost of debt in this example is 12%, okay, it's written there. I'm asking, without even doing any calculation, this answer here will be a number less than 100. Why? Um, no, there are bonds that are actually traded at the prices larger than their face value. It is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. See, going forward, your investment is giving you return at a rate of 8%. But you're penalizing those returns when you pull them back at a rate of 12%. So the top is growing at a rate that's smaller than the rate that you're pulling them back, which is why the price, when you benchmark it against the face value, the price will sit below the face value. Okay? So that's uh, very similar to what we did in terms of uh, internal rate of return and zero MPV concept in the first class. Okay? Now I can, let, let, let's, uh, for those of you who might be missed the first class, let's look at the simplest benchmark case. If, I'm pay if this bond is paying a coupon of 12%, then what must be the case? They, they align exactly. Okay, 12% uh, coupon balance with the 12% cost of capital, a uh, cost of debt in this case, means that the price aligns nicely, exactly with the face value. If you don't believe me, you put $12 here. If you do the calculation, a similar calculation, but with $12, $12 here, you wouldn't get, a, you would not get a number close to 100. You would get exactly 100 because. In terms of the algebra, everything cancels out in terms of the calculation. Okay? And last but not least, if the coupon is actually, if the bond is paying you coupon at say 12%, sorry, at say 15%, that means that the price would actually be above the face value. Okay? So this is the uh, simple, this is something similar to uh, internal rate of return zero MPV situation. But in terms of the calculation, it's just the annuity for five sets of uh, annual cash flow, $8 each. So you know the, uh, uh, yeah, 
this thing that we're all sick of by now, we do all this annuity, $8, yada, yada. Get your answer. Remember to discount the face value as well, okay? Or else you'll get a very small number. And it's uh, $85 and uh, 58 cents, give or take. It doesn't really matter, okay? Value of the convertible note, okay? I guarantee you, I will not ask this question. <laughs> Okay, um, it, 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 I will not ask this question, okay? I, I might ask you to price the bond, but not the convertible note, because we, we cannot price the warrant component, okay? So don't worry about that. Okay? If you're interested in the option pricing, I mean, do feel free to sit in class next uh, year if you're still around. I mean, it's one thing to say, uh, I, I don't dare to enroll, but you can just sit in. It, the marginal cost of an additional student in class is very trivial, as far as I'm concerned, okay? So feel free to sit in or ask me for more details, okay? Now, just to uh, get a bit of sense of things, uh, we'll do three more slides and then we'll take a break. Why issue convertible notes? I mean, the uh, Telstra PCCW case would actu actually show the motivation, because if you want exposure to something, you cannot just issue bonds to the uh, person who uh, supplies the capital to you because if it's bonds to you as a company, you can just pay off the bond and they disappear. So if they want something else in your company, then you can't pay, you can't issue them bonds. Okay, so that's one thing. But what I have here are two common miscon misconceptions on why convertible notes are um, popular with companies, why companies choose to issue convertible notes. Okay, there are misconceptions. Now, they can, the first misconception is, oh, the notes, in a, uh, or in this case, the coupons uh, of 8%, um, they're cheaper. So we can, if we issue convertible notes, we can issue them at lower cost relative to just a normal bond. Um, so that's a misconception. Why? Because the lower cost that is uh, demanded by the note in convertible note investors is actually expected. Why is it expected? relative to a, a normal bond, I mean. Now, if you um, invest in a normal bond at maturity, you know exactly what's going to happen. When the bond matures, the company pays you back the face value and everything ends there. So the, 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 the amount that you get back at maturity is simply the face value, X. So that's pretty predictable. But if it's a convertible bond, you could get X but you could also get something else, which is? <laughs> don't know, don't know. SDT. You could choose to get yourself a larger number. So it is that ability to get something more, which is why you say, okay, you might be willing to charge less in return for getting something more at time capital T. With normal bondholders, they would only get back the face value. But as far as you're concerned, as the convertible note holder, you could get X, but you could get something even larger. So that's why, in return, you could charge them a lower cost. So the lower uh, cost of borrowing is expected because of that additional uh, feature, the ability to get something more in the com uh, from the company in terms of new shares. Now, the second misconception, and I don't even know why this is a misconception, actually, but I just thought I'd mention this because this is in the textbooks. Um, it allows the company to sell shares at a premium relative to current market price. So I thought I'd just throw in some numbers to illustrate. I actually have two comments on this. Either one suffices to uh, dismiss this uh, statement. Anyone what would be the first uh, obvious point? <laughs> if I give you the current share price, $18.50, and X is 20 why is this irrelevant? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that is actually the second better one, but good. S, um, the current share price here is irrelevant because what I need to compare is actually the share price at this point in time. So why are you telling me that uh, I could sell my shares at a premium based on the current share price? Because what would actually happen is I need to compare the uh, exercise, I, I need to compare X not against the current share price, but against the maturity date share price. So if the maturity date share price um, is 22, and if the current share price is 20, then I wouldn't be issuing shares at a discount, at a premium. I would actually be issuing shares at a discount. I'm only receiving, the company's only receiving $20 for shares that are worth 22. Okay, so that's the uh, thing here. Okay, so I, I don't even know why this is a misconception, but anyway. I, even, I have an even uh, a better one um, to look at. See, let's assume that those convertible, 
you, you as the uh, convertible note holder, for some bizarre reason, you are actually able to decide now to either redeem or convert. You don't have to wait to time capital T. If you want, you can do it right now. And I will still say that this is irrelevant. Why? If the company, if I as the company say to you, okay, feel free to convert or redeem. Yeah, I know exactly. Even, even if you are able to convert now, you still wouldn't do it. Because why would you convert um, to get $18.50? You should simply just redeem, get $20, pay $18.50 and keep $1.50 in your pocket. So sometimes all these uh, textbook misconceptions are pretty uh, strange to me, okay? So that's why this statement is um, bizarre. It doesn't make sense. But the first one, I guess, has some logic. I mean, people say that uh, the borrowing cost seems to be lower, but they're forgetting the fact that those convertible notes, they're actually giving the investors something extra, the ability to choose to get something larger at the end. So that's why they, they would then say, okay, because I can get something larger, I would impose a lower borrowing cost to you. Okay, so that, that at least uh, needs some discussion to draw out why they are, being, they are being able to be issued at lower cost. Yeah, but the second one, I, I don't understand what's going on. Okay. We will uh, do this slide and then we'll take a short break. Okay, this one would sum everything together uh, in terms of the various scenarios. Because you see, the, the two key scenarios that we've discussed thus far are the scenarios of redeem versus convert. Okay, so those seem to be the two scenarios. This third scenario allows me to tie everything together. And by doing so, I would also be uh, talking a bit about this expression in terms of what it means. Okay. Now we know what this expression means. Um, I mean, if we, if we want to say something about SDT versus X, then we're talking about, okay, should I redeem or should I convert? Okay, so that's easy enough if I were to compare just between these two notations. But where, does, where is this coming from? Oh, this funny looking thing here. Okay, so let's try to tie everything together. Okay. Okay, so I thought I'll draw this picture that would pretty much it will give a very good summary on everything that we're going to do on convertible notes. Okay, so for this particular slide here, now we know that there's uh, one scenario whereby, um, for whatever reason, the convertible note holders would choose to redeem, and if they redeem, they would get X. Okay, so if they redeem. you would think that oh, th there would be a range of share price, the price of the uh, firm, whereby note holders would say, okay, I want to redeem my notes and take my money elsewhere. And if they choose to redeem, then the value that they're actually getting at um, time capital T, if they redeem, is simply X. Okay, so that's the notation that we use. But we also know that, okay, there'll be another scenario where they would actually choose to convert their notes into new shares. Now if they convert, um, now I if I point to you and say that this is the boundary that distinguishes between redeem and convert. And this is redeem, so you know that this probably will be a convert. Now it makes sense because you see, it, this I know that this region corresponds to the region of convert or conversion because this region corresponds to high share price. Now if the share price are, if the share price is at the high end, then the note holder would have every incentive to want to convert. Because they're saying, Wow, you're doing very well. Um, please keep the face value, I like to join the party. So I want to become a note holder. I want to become a shareholder as well. So you wouldn't want to take X. You would want to actually take new shares because the, if you take new shares, each shares is worth a lot. Okay. So if you were to draw this part of the graph, you know that it will look something like the following. It means that the value that you're getting 
would actually increase. Why? Because it would increase with each uh, work, the, the, with the value of each share. Because each node converts into a certain number of shares, and if the value of each share is more, that means that the value that you're getting is also increasing. Okay. So this really looks like the uh, call option payoff to you, uh, something that I've drawn last week as well. Okay. So this is the region of uh, convert. Okay. Now, if I uh, this will be a simple question. I hope um, if I have to mark this down, because you see, the, the diluted share price SDT can be any number it wants, but we want a number that actually marks the difference between re redeem and convert. But this should be quite easy. What is this uh, notation? If I were to mark down this point, yeah, yeah, this is just X. X is the one that sets the difference between whether I redeem or convert. Because all along, we've, we've been comparing between SDT and X, those two numbers. Okay. Now, this is another uh, region here that uh, corresponds to this particular slide. So, now you've already seen the heading, you know that this is corresponding to default, which simply means the following. Now, if I were to uh, ask, say to you, if the share price, for whatever reason, plunges to zero, what do you think you'll be getting at time capital T when you uh, take your convertible notes and, uh, and go to the company? If the share price is zero, then the value that you'll be getting is probably <laughs> zero. And the company probably delisted already. <laughs> okay, so it's zero. And you see, you only need two points to plot a straight line, which means that the remaining part of the graph will look like this. So you could call this the uh, redeem under default scenario. So if I were to do this properly, this would be the region whereby, okay, you choose to redeem. You're desperate to redeem, in fact. But for every dollar that you own, you probably get back 60 cents, 45 cents. You'd be lucky to get more than half, actually. Okay, so this is the region whereby uh, you redeem, but the company is unable to actually repay you everything that it owns you. Okay, so this is the uh, trouble scenario. Redeem, but you won't get back everything. Okay. I guess to finish off this picture is this question of okay, where does uh, how do I then do this marking to then say that the company will be in some sort of trouble in terms of actually uh, even if I redeem, I might not get back everything. Okay. So this is what the uh, remaining part of the, uh, um, the 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 last line of this slide is about, and the idea behind it is uh, very simple. This is the uh, value of the company at terminal date when the uh, convertible notes mature. If all note holders redeem, how much would the company actually own? There are M convertible notes. I've used the same notations before. Each has a face value of X. So the total amount that a com of liability that a company is facing is MX. Now, to say that a company is trouble is simply to say what? that BT is actually, that the total worth of the company, oh, sorry, thank you, yeah, <laughs> let's start again. So this is the worth of the company at time capital T. The amount that it owns is M notes, face value, X per note. To say that the company is in trouble simply means that BT is actually less. The total worth of the company is less than the amount that it owns. Okay, so this is the uh, scenario that corresponds to default. That I'm not able to pay back every single dollar that I own. I may pay back 60 cents, 45 cents, but I cannot pay back everything that I own. And what is BT? Because you see, we are trying to we are trying to map everything on a per share basis. Because you see, this uh, the horizontal axis is is in terms of SDT, but we can easily transform BT in terms of SDT, right? What is uh, BT? Um, this one, this thing here, okay. Okay, so VT is simply just SDT M plus N, which is still less than MX under the default scenario. So all I need to do is just move things around, and SDT is uh, less than M, M plus N divided, uh, sorry, multiplied by X. And I know that uh, because this fraction 
must be a number that is what? Zero, greater than zero, less than one. This fraction itself must be less than one because m divided by m plus m must be less than one. That's how I know that this term must be less than x and this is actually on this side. Okay. So this is just a way of uh, summarizing everything that could happen to a convertible node at time capital T under the three possible scenarios. The uh, right hand side is uh, everything's go well, the party's uh, going hot, so we convert, join the party, we redeem, we say, oh, the party's not too good, okay, uh, I like to take my face value and go elsewhere. And this part is, uh, please give me back my face value, oh my goodness, what's happening? Okay, so this uh, scenario is here. And they correspond to, uh, I guess this is not so much a uh, formula, this is just trying to say, you know, the share price, the uh, terminal date share price could be, is being bounded by those two um, boundary points. And those two boundary points say something about the different situations. If it's to the left of, uh, if it's to the right of X, it means convert. If it's in between, it's redeem. If it's less than that, then we like to redeem, but we might not get, we probably wouldn't get back everything. Okay, so those three scenarios there. Okay, so if you have this picture, it would give you a better feel for what's happening uh, on the convertible note investor's point of view. Okay, on this point. Okay. Good. And that's basically uh, it. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the mechanics of convertible notes are not that difficult. Of course, it is a different situation to try to explain to retail investors in an annual general meeting as what the Telstra CFO was trying to do. But can we just uh, do one quick slide here and then we'll start after 10 minutes on converting preference shares directly. I just want to talk a bit on preference shares because I, I can't be sure that you know anything about preference shares. So I just want to say something about preference shares first and then move on to the one that I really want to talk about. Okay? Now, preference shares, as the name implies, preference, I'll just, you can read the rest for yourself, okay? Um, I'll just highlight the two key points to you. Why they are called preference shares? They are rank above ordinary shares, okay? They are rank above ordinary shares in terms of two important aspects. If, if things go wrong, if the company gets into trouble, preference shareholders are rank above ordinary shareholders, okay? So if there's anything left after a company pay off its loans, then the preference shareholders would get those uh, remaining resources ahead of ordinary shareholders. So that's why they're called preference shares. It's not just the uh, um, access to uh, resources when the company gets into trouble. It's also the uh, regular income. For most, well, at least for those uh, preference shares that I've invested in, the companies are not allowed to pay ordinary shares until they are able, unless they are able to pay preference shares. Because you see, with preference shares, the dividend payment is well specified. It's not like ordinary shares. Ordinary shares, they say, oh, we hope to maintain our past dividend payment. We might increase it, yeah, yeah. But with preference shares, it's actually well specified. So they are not allowed to pay ordinary shareholders dividends until they can actually pay preference shares their dividends. So there's a pecking order in terms of uh, who gets it first. So that's why preference shares are prioritized above ordinary shares. That's why they're called preference shares in the first place. Of course, there's a lot more, it, it gets a lot more complicated when we look at the tax issues, but those are the things that are, we won't be discussing. I mean, do, are the dividends, interest payments really, and you know, all those classifications for tax purposes things, but we, we won't worry about that, okay? So I just want you to have some awareness of the, uh, the ranking order um, with preference shares, okay? Okay, good. We'll take uh, 10 minutes and then we'll start on uh, converting preference shares, okay? I'll see you in uh, 10 minutes.
Right, let's uh, restart the workshop. All right, please take your seats. Oh. Right, for the uh, second half of this workshop, we're going to look at the other types of uh, uh, the other type of uh, hybrid security, which is this thing called converting preference shares. So, you see, converting preference shares, uh, unlike they, they they seem to behave in a similar fashion to convertible notes. You see, both have the word convert in front of them, and uh, as as you'll know soon enough, uh, they'll, they'll eventually turn into ordinary shares. Okay, so with convertible notes uh, at maturity, or it could turn into ordinary shares. With uh, converting preference shares, 
they would also turn into ordinary shares. Okay, so at that point, it appears that those two are very similar. Okay, in that uh, the word converting means that they would eventually turn into ordinary shares. Okay, so that's uh, one uh, one way of looking at it. Now, the reason why um, preference shares are being regarded more like debt securities rather than um, equity is because of this um, clearly specified uh, re interim return to investors in terms of uh, fixed dividends or dividend paid based on some well-specified predetermined um, conditions. So unlike ordinary shares where the, the implicit understanding with ordinary shares is that okay, we try to maintain it or at least increase it uh, bit by bit every year or every half year. But with um, um, preference shares, the dividend yield is well specified. Okay, it's clearly specified to preference shareholders. So it's as if preference shares behave more like uh, debt securities rather than um, ordinary shares. So that's the uh, idea behind it. Okay. So what I thought I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll go through the uh, mechanics of a converting preference shares using a very recent um, um, issue, as recent as uh, December last year by ANZ Bank. And I know this very well because I've uh, invested quite a bit into this uh, particular issue. Okay? So that's how I have the prospectus. So if you want, you can have a glance at the prospectus. Okay? Please don't print it out. It's 108 pages long. Um, if you want, you can print the two pages on the tables, the tables where they list out all the key details of the uh, CPS. Now you can imagine this back to what I said last week uh, about um, IPOs. If a, if a regular season offering by a well-known Australian bank requires a 108-page prospectus, you can imagine if it's an IPO by an unknown company, how thick the prospectus is going to be. <laughs> Okay, even a, a sort of simple issue by a well-established bank requires 108 pages prospectus. The amount of resource that goes into an IPO is uh, even larger. Okay, so that's how much work needs to be done in terms of uh, the details that needs to go into it. Okay. So again, I'll talk through the mechanics uh, um, of a um, converting preference shares uh, using this particular case. And this is the case that I know very well because every day I check the share price and things like that. Okay, the uh, issue price is hundred dollars. The reason why preference shares needs to have some sort of face value, like a convertible bond, is because the dividend yield is some percentage rate, and the percentage needs to fit off some number, or else you can say I'll pay you five percent dividend. Five percent of what? So you need some sort of benchmark. You need some fixed face value price. So that's why, uh, in this case, it's called issue price. Okay, it's hundred dollars. So if you subscribe to it, you have to pay hundred dollars. The dividend payment frequency is uh, the dividend payment occurs uh, every quarter, so every three months. Unlike ordinary shares over here, they pay interim and final dividends, so twice a year. But with uh, this sort of converting preference shares, they pay me dividends every quarter. Okay, every quarter. And the dividend that they are paying me is a uh, very uh, it is well specified. It is not fixed, but it is well specified. Okay, it's based on the following. Um, the the benchmark floating rate that they use is the 90-day bank accepted bill. So bank accepted bill is a very liquid short-term money market in Australia. Okay, so that's what BAP stands for, bank accepted bill. And what ANZ does is it adds it adds a 3.1 percent markup on that. Um, 90 day bank accepted bill rate. Um, they have to minus off because they're going to pay it from after tax profit. So that's why minus the corporate tax rate. And then uh, multiply by the face value or the issue price. And last but not least, scale it for the number of days in a quarter. Some quarters have 92 days, some have 89, etc., etc. So they count it right down to the number of days. Okay, so that's how they do their calculation in terms of giving me my uh, uh, quarterly dividends um, each every three months. Okay, so so that's uh, one simple example of how a preference share dividend is being calculated. It, it is not fixed to the extent that the 90-day bank asset bill fluctuates. Uh, currently, it is a 4.32 percent, I think. So, but it does fluctuate a bit. Okay, so yeah. So it is not fixed per se, but it is very well specified in the prospectus. So I know exactly what I'm getting um, from this uh, preference shares. Okay. Um, having said that, the dividends are non-compulsory, so 
okay, if we pay, we pay you based on this um, um, contractual agreement between us. But we didn't say anything about promising to pay you every quarter. So uh, it is non-compulsory, and more, just as importantly, it is non-cumulative. What it means is that, okay, if we happen to miss one quarter of dividend payment, it doesn't mean that we'll make it up for it next quarter. Okay, if we miss it this quarter, too bad. You'll be lucky if we pay you next quarter as well. Okay, so it is non-compulsory, number one, and it is non-cumulative. If we miss out this quarter, we, we will not make up for it next quarter. Okay? Uh, that's typical of all, uh, most preference shares and converting preference shares. There's no voting rights, or very little. Um, and there's all these other clauses where they can uh, convert it early, depending on major corporate events, etc., etc. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, and you see, num number one, for converting preference shares, unlike convertible notes, the conversion is compulsory. That's number one. And number two, the conversion share price is based on the price or price range closer to the conversion date. So whatever you foresee and whatever is being used for the conversion, they are both closer to time capital T, so the discrepancy isn't that much. Yeah. So that's why I think that was designed to avoid the sort of problem that you were trying to say there. Yeah. Okay. And for this particular uh, issue that I subscribe to, the uh, it's a seven-year uh, converting preference share, so it expi uh, the the capital T is in is on 15th of December 2016. So it's the seven-year converting preference shares maturity. And so the conversion term, and if you want the general expression for it, it's on the next slide. Okay. It's this expression here. But I thought I'd just give you some numbers as a preempt, okay? So the conversion is based on, uh, in terms of the number of shares that each converting preference shares would turn into, it is the issue price divided by some benchmark conversion share price and with some sort of small discount being applied. So w when we look at some numerical examples, uh, we'll go through this properly, but for my case, oh sorry, for uh, co ANZ converting preference shares, the issue price is 100. The discount that they give me is 1%, so they take 1% off the conversion share price. Now the conversion share price is always set as some sh uh, the price closer to the conversion date. So the simplest case uh, would be, okay, the latest closing price before conversion date. So that, that would be the simplest one. You take the, the, the day before. If conversion date is today, as in Thursday, they'll take Wednesday's closing price. So that's the easiest, just take that one number. But you see, for most uh, cases, uh, companies would use some sort of average price. So they don't just look at yesterday's price, because yesterday's price could be, a very, could be affected by some extreme numbers uh, or events. So they try to take some sort of average over a given window. So for my case, it's, uh, it's a 20-day average price window, so they take the previous 20 days uh, um, trade closing price before conversion date, and they use uh, they take the average. It is not a simple average; it is, it is some volume weighted average. So I, I mentioned a bit about this last week. It's called VWAP. So they they use trading volume of uh, ANZ shares, ordinary shares, to work out the uh, average price. And the idea there is that uh, they pay more attention to the closing prices associated with heavy trading volume. Because they presume that uh, more trading volume means there's more things happening, so those prices deserve more attention. So that's what VWAP is. Now, I don't have to worry about calculating, okay? Because I, I didn't show you how to calculate, I didn't set any tutorial questions, so you don't have to worry about the calculation, but at least have some idea on what VWAP is. It, it is a very commonly used uh, measure among practitioners, so at least you heard about it. Okay, VWAP is volume weighted average uh, uh, price measure. Okay, so this is the specific terms to my ANZ converting preference shares. But as a sort of a basic, getting the basic mechanics, it is just N equals I over S1 minus D. 
where D is the amount of discount that they apply on the uh, conversion share price. Okay. So S is the benchmark share price. It could be the day before's price. So if today's Thursday, they, they may use uh, Wednesday's closing price, or they use the previous 20 trading days uh, closing price weighted by volume, so 20 day V1. Okay. Conversion discount, example 1%, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Okay. So this is uh, easy enough in terms of the simple mechanics. All right, let's uh, go into the numbers, and the calculation will be on the next slide, but let's work through these details. I think there's uh, it's a bit of rep repetition here because I used the same example. But what actually happened is they tr ANZ tried to raise uh, 1.7 billion by issuing uh, 70 million uh, CPS. They did one in uh, 2008, so they called this, which is the 2009 issue, uh, CPS2. So they call it Mark II. Okay, so they did one in October 2008 as well. Okay. So they tried to raise 1.7 billion by issuing 70 million, which means that the issue price of each convertible, uh, converting preference shares is $100. 1.7 billion divided by 70 million. Okay. Uh, it will convert in seven years' time into ordinary shares, 1% discount, 20 day VWAP as the uh, benchmark conversion share price. So let's work through the mechanics in terms of okay, at conversion date, what happens if the uh, benchmark share price is this number, this number, this number, this number, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So we, we cover a, a whole range of numbers to get a feel for the uh, uh, outcome. Okay? Now, um, before going to the uh, calculation, I mean, if you see the, first, the numbers for the first line, you can see the numbers for the entire table. Okay? There's no reason why you can understand the first line, but you don't understand the second line. Okay? But before that, I want to just get a, some sort of conceptual view of things. The number of shares that each CPS will convert into is affected by a few things. Now, technically speaking, it is only affected by one variable. Because you see, I, the issue price is fixed. Okay, this number doesn't change. D, which is the discount that will be applied, doesn't change as well. So in other words, these two uh, terms here are constants. So the number of shares that you will eventually get is only affected by the conversion share price. And the relationship between these two is inverse. If the conversion share price becomes, as the conversion share price becomes larger and larger, the number of shares that you eventually get will become smaller and smaller. But what can you also say is the number of shares that you'll be getting is actually not as meaningful to you as the worth of those shares in terms of dollars and cents, isn't it? I mean, you don't care whether it is 10 shares or 100 million shares. You're more interested in the dollars and cents worth. Now, as the conversion share price increase, for sure, you're getting less and less shares. But what can you also say about the worth of the shares in terms of dollars and cents? Okay, if you get less and less shares, what can you also say about the worth of each share that you're getting? Yeah, each is worth more. You're getting less, but each share is worth more. If you're getting a whole bunch of shares, if each uh, converting preference shares turns into a whole bunch of shares, it must be the case that the worth of each share is small. So you see, there's a balance between those two. So although as the conversion share price gets larger and larger, the number of shares you're getting is smaller and smaller, but you can also see that the worth of your shares in terms of dollars and cents should actually stay pretty stable. Now, yeah, that's right. So the dollar and cents worth is the same. In fact, according to this table, it's a constant. Because <laughs> you see, the worth of your shares in terms of dollars and cents is simply n times s. Now, what is n times s according to this expression? If it's n times s, it is simply i divided by 1 minus d. Because if I move s up here, I'll get a measure in terms of dollars and cents. And it is determined by i over 1 minus d. i is a constant, d is a constant. So the worth that you're getting is a constant. That's why it's 101.01 .01 all the way. Because it's simply 100, if you want some numbers, this is 100 divided by 0 0.99. Okay, a 1% discount. And just in case you're, you're not even sure what, uh, how do I get 4.59, I'll, I'll, I better write this down, okay? Okay. If it's uh, $22, 
if $22 is the conversion share price and at a 1% discount, so this is 1 minus 0 0.01, issue price is 100, that's how I get my $4.59, $4.59. Give or take a few cents, okay, it doesn't really matter. That, yeah. So as the worth of the share increases, the number of shares that I'm getting will decrease. We expected that from the simple expression. But the worth of my shares doesn't just stay stable. If it's defined by n times s, it's actually a constant, 101.01. Okay. Of course, this is the, um, um, shall we say, the old generation of converting preference shares. And, uh, some of the uh, less informed investors will, 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 will look at this and say, oh, gee, th this is it's not really a lot in terms of capital gains. I mean, I invested $100. In a few years' time, I'll only get back $101.01. Of course, you have to then balance it with the uh, dividends that you're actually getting on a regular basis. And you need to compare that against the, uh, the uh, your own required rate of return. Okay, So that's the, where the main story is, the dividends that you're getting could you actually get that return elsewhere? So, um, <laughs> you mean you might not receive it? Yeah, yeah. But you see, the uh, for this case, and okay, whatever response I'll give you will probably be biased as an investor. But you see, I check it very properly. ANZ is not allowed to pay ordinary shares any dividend, ordinary shareholders any dividends unless they pay me. So I'm thinking, gee, if ANZ Bank is unable to pay ordinary shares any dividend, try gee, they're in deep trouble. I'm, that's the last thing I'll be worried about. So yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. They cannot pay ordinary shares dividends before they satisfy this. Yeah. At least that's what I read in the prospectus. I could be wrong, but I've read it very properly. Yeah. No, I only read the uh, table. Uh, the table summarizes everything. The rest are all fluff. I think they're all fluff, but I could be wrong, but yeah. So, so that's what the uh, thing was. So you see, it's not so much about the capital gain, it's more about the, uh, the huge dividend that you're getting versus what you could have got elsewhere. Okay? That's the main part with uh, um, preference shares, I guess. But having said that, some other um, issues try to then improve to say, oh, gee, okay, the capital gain at the end might not be big, so let's try to uh, beef it up somehow. Let's, you know, maybe we cut a bit back on the dividends, and give them a bit more in terms of uh, capital gain. So other t uh, the second generation of uh, converting preference shares, I guess this is par, um, partially a sort of marketing scheme, is to give uh, investors an impression that, OK, um, you could have potential capital gains as well. So they add something to the conversion term. So it's not just I over S1 minus D. That's what we've discussed before. Okay, So this is still there. They actually set a maximum conversion price Z. I'll use the notation Z here, okay? This is what most textbooks use. They say, okay, we'll set a maximum conversion uh, share price to you. Now, why would this uh, make it, why would they actually do this? I'll go straight to the, uh, this last line, which is the question, and then we'll go through the ECBC uh, mechanics of this uh, expression here. Would, if the conversion term, the number of shares that you're getting, if it's based on this expression, is it more or less appealing than the previous expression, which is this one? It's not a trick question, I hope. Um, anyone? Should it be more or less appealing, this expression? No response. Not good. I would like to stick to this first before the less or more appealing. You, you can't see this or to to potential investors. I mean, if the if the if it so happens that this expression become okay, this whole expression has one of two terms, one of two fractions: the first fraction or the second fraction. Now, if the first fraction applies then it is exactly the same as this. So it is at least as good. At least as good in terms of the number of shares that each uh, converting preference shareholder will eventually get. It is at least as good as this. But if the second term 
becomes larger than the first term, then each converting preference shareholder will get more shares. So you get at least as many shares as the first term, but you could also get more. So it should actually be more attractive, thank you. Okay, more attractive, it is more attractive. It is at least as good as the original uh, expression. And sometimes it could be better. Okay, so now my, uh, I've already had a backup because I know it's uh, week six and you are worried about assignments and, and there's a test tomorrow, so please remember. And for goodness sake, remember to save your answer. Okay, I don't want to have to do all those things again. Remember to save, you're supposed to save your answer to multiple choice question, okay? And it is 12, Friday, 12 noon, okay? It's not 12 midnight. And if you're in a different time zone, please keep that into account as well, okay? To the off-campus students, etc., etc. okay? Now, um, it is <laughs> more appealing, okay? Okay, we'll have a numerical example to show us clearly. But let's, let's try to work through the basic mechanics of this, okay? So there's only a few slides to go. Now, for sure, let's look at the, uh, the two important terms that determine whether the first fraction applies or the second fraction applies. Because you see, with both fractions, the numerator is exactly the same. It is i and i, so we don't have to worry about the top. Okay? Now, so let's focus on the two terms at the denominator. If s1 minus d is less than z, which is larger? Which fraction is larger? Actually, I have no idea. Let me think. Uh, if s1 minus d is less than z, is this fraction larger or is this fraction larger? The first one. Yeah, I was only pretending I didn't know, okay? The first one is larger. So if the first one is larger, everything that we've discussed before applies. In other words, if the first term applies, then each converting preference shares would turn into a fixed dollar value of shares, as what we've discussed here before, okay? So it will turn into a fixed dollar value of ordinary shares, as in the previous example. Now, if S1 minus D is greater than Z, that means that uh, the second term, the second fraction is larger. And if it's larger, keep in mind that uh, n, now just a very small note here, some of you might have this as m, okay? Please change this to n, it's a typing error on my part, okay? It's n. Now if n is determined by i divided by z, i is fixed, it is a constant. z is a clearly specified maximum price, it doesn't change, it is also a constant. So it must mean that n will turn into a fixed number of shares, okay? It will turn into a fixed number of shares. Okay. So you can sort of summarize this expression with the following. If the first fraction applies, your converting preference share will turn into a fixed value of shares in terms of dollars and cents. If the second fraction applies, your converting preference shares will turn into a fixed number of shares. Now if it turns into a fixed number of shares, what can you also guess is happening in terms of the dollar value of the shares? If, okay, focus on this scenario, and again, if you don't get it, never mind, the backup plan is in the numerical example, but you see, it, this scenario will imply that you will receive a fixed number of shares. Okay? We all agree on that. You will receive a fixed number of shares. But what this is also saying is that the share price, the worth of each share is actually very large or small? Large. It, it, in order for this first expression to be larger than z, it must mean that s is becoming larger and larger. So, but hang on, at the same time, based on this condition, we are getting a fixed number of shares. But if the share price is getting larger and larger, that means that the dollar value of our fixed number of shares is also getting larger and larger. Okay, so we are we're getting that sort of uh, mechanics there. And if you combine those two together, it means that, okay, if one fraction applies, I get at least a certain value of shares in terms of dollars and cents. But if the second expression kicks in, I get a larger value of shares. Okay, so it has that. Um, you might buy one cake and they give you half a cake free sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, that's why I say this is partially a marketing type scheme where they say, okay, you buy one, get half free, or buy two, get one free type thing. Yeah, okay. Now, if you're still not totally clear, okay, this would do it. If it doesn't, then, okay, go to the tutorial, okay? 
Let's uh, look at this and hopefully this will set it up. Uh, we're not far from home, or at least from, from my perspective. <laughs> $100 each, okay, CPS, so I keep that the same. Now, I change a bit here just so you don't fixate yourself with just 1%, okay? I change this to 10%, a 10% discount. Um, and the other thing I add is that, okay, this has a maximum conversion share price of $4.50 per share, Z, okay, $4.50. And again, I play around with, okay, different numbers here, okay, a range of conversion date share price and work through the numbers here and things like that, okay? So I've, I've done the uh, calculation for you for the first line, and again, I'll go through the first line in detail with you. If you can see all the calculations for the first row with $3 conversion share price, you should be able to see all of them. But there's no reason why you can't see them, okay? So for the first uh, row, uh, if we use the first fraction, it's 100 divided by 3, 1 minus 0 0.1, so it's 0 0.9, and it gives me 3704. Two decimal play and three decimal play doesn't matter. Okay. Now, if it's i divided by z, um, very quickly, anyone, how do I get this number? Hundred divided by four point five. Okay, very easy. So it's i divided by z. Hundred divided by four point five, and it is a, a constant throughout the entire column. That's why it's twenty two point two two, all the way down. Whereas uh, for the first fraction, you know that as the share price increases, the number of shares uh, will actually decrease. Okay? So that's what's happening as with the first example. But if our payoff, in ter sorry, if our conversion term takes the maximum of either the first expression, the first fraction, or the second fraction, that means that, okay, for, beginning, uh, for the beginning few rows, it will be 37.04, 31.45, so on and so forth, until it hits a point whereby uh, this column here, if it falls below 22.22, then 22.22 shares will kick in and it will remain at 22.22 all the way down. Okay? So that's why the number of shares converted will gradually decrease, but it will decrease up until $22.22 and then it stops there. It will remain at $22.22, that's what this is saying. So what is also happening is, okay, for the first shall we say, the first half of the table. Now, if I ask, ask you to try to get a general picture of this, uh, the numbers in this uh, table. Okay, sorry, before that. In case you don't follow this number, okay. How do I get 111.11? Well, it is just 37.04 multiplied by 3, okay? And um, this is just 31.45 multiplied by 3.5, okay? So that should be pretty uh, um, reasonably obvious, okay? Now, if I ask you to uh, get a sort of more general picture of what's going on with this table as we analyze across uh, gradually increasing conversion share price, what can you say about roughly the top half of the table versus the bottom half of the table in terms of getting a picture of what's going on? Anyone? Um, focus on this column. <laughs> you see, our payoff, it, everything's driven by this expression. So how do you link this expression to the two halves of this table? If I were to ask you any more directly, what I'm ask, trying to ask is uh, which of the two fractions apply to the top half and which of the two fractions apply to the bottom half? The first expression applies to the top half, and that is why you are actually receiving a fixed dollar value of shares. The second expression kicks in to guarantee you a minimum number of shares, even though the share price, the conversion share price is increasing. And that is why you are getting a fixed number of shares, but because the share price is increasing, you are getting increasing dollar value of shares here. Okay? So the top half is governed by the first expression, so you receive a fixed dollar value. The bottom half is governed by the second fraction. That's why you receive a constant number of shares, but you're receiving increasing value in terms of dollars and cents. Okay, so that's what's happening when you move down the uh, price scale from $3, $4, $5, $6. Okay? Uh, as you gradually increase, the conversion mechanism switches from the first fraction to the second fraction. So that's what's happening uh, with this table. So that's what I'm trying to uh, um, show you in terms of getting a sense of uh, what's going on here.
Now, you, you, following from that, you would also know, and this is the last question to finish, finish off this uh, numerical example, that there must be a price, there must be a conversion share price that marks the crossover between the two terms, isn't it? When we switch from the first fraction to the second fraction, there has to be a price that marks the crossover from one to the other. And it would be quite meaningful for me to know what that price is because I can then know what I'll be getting, whether I'll be converted based on the first expression or the second expression. So how do I work out that, you know, that price that marks the crossover from the first fraction to the second fraction? You know what I'm trying to ask? I'm trying to ask, you see, when we go down the scale, we know that all of a sudden, everything switches from this to this. I'm trying to ask the point where it crosses over. Ah, oh, very good. Um, yeah, you gave me the final answer I was thinking about. See, if I want to, very good, that is the answer. If I want to mark out the uh, indifference point between the two expressions, all I simply need to do is the following. Okay? Yeah. If I'm asking what is this value that marks the crossover between the two, or where the two are the same, then I just need to write this down. And all I need to do is to just set S equal to the rest of it. Okay? Okay. It's uh, S1 minus D equal to Z. Z is 4.5. So 1 minus D is 0 0.9. So it is uh, 4.5 divided by 0 0.9, giving you $5. So that's why, uh, that's why I put $5 here. You see, $5 is the point of indifference. And it, it is the point where we switch from the first expression to the second expression. See, if it's $5, both columns gives you the same answer. 22.22. And if you go beyond $5, the second fraction kicks in. And that's where the value of a share, the dollar value of a share upon conversion starts to increase. Okay, it starts to increase after $5. Okay, so that's uh, what's happening with this uh, converting preference shares. Okay. So it seems to be giving uh, um, um, converting preference shareholders some sort of uh, hope that oh, if, if things do very well, then our value would um, still, we would, we would still have an opportunity to participate in the capital gains. Unlike the previous case where everything seems to be, there seems to be no hope. It's just 101.01. .01. Okay. So this seems to be something that appeals to, uh, uh, appeals more to investors. But of course, if they do something like this, then the dividend that they're that they're able to pay out will be smaller. So it's a balance between the two. Okay. But anyway, those are the two common types of converting preference shares there. Right, the next two slides is just to uh, summarize. We've done those two instruments, so we'll summarize them and then I'll, I'll ask a few questions to try to draw out the... Uh, it, it's easy to see the similarity, but it may not be that easy to see the uh, differences between the two. They, they, they look quite the same, but they're not... They're, they're quite different, okay? The, the, the differences are actually very important, okay? But just to summarize, okay, they, they behave like debt securities because they promise fixed dividend, they give you some sort of fixed capital gain, well, not in this case, but in the, at least in the previous case, some sort of fixed capital gain. Um, but they are actually riskier than uh, debt securities. Why? Because they rank below uh, borrowers upon liquidation. Okay? Because they are actually equity, even though they are preference shares, but they are still ranked below uh, borrowers, for example, bank loans. They are ranked below them. Um, the dividends are fixed for sure, like interest payments, but nothing's been said about we promising to pay you the dividends. So, okay, we, we do specify it clearly that we'll pay you based on this rate, but uh, we didn't say that it is compulsory for us to pay, and we didn't say anything about the being cumulative, okay? Um, it's non-cumulative as well, okay? And as far as the capital return is concerned, well, strictly speaking, it is not exactly fixed. I mean, if you look at this, um, see, if you look at this column here, it seems to say that, okay, we'll get this value of shares in terms of dollars and cents. But that's not exactly true. There's still a bit of risk there, uh, although it is not as big a deal. You see, um, there's two points here. Now, the second one is a bit more trivial, so I'll go through that first. To actually get all these values, you need to actually sell your shares. 
I mean, that's a pretty obvious statement, okay? So if you wait two months, then sell your shares, then the share price will move and you wouldn't get all these values, okay? So that's pretty obvious. If you want to get all these values, uh, as determined by this calculation here, you have to actually sell your shares while they're still within range, while they're still, you know, the share, current share price is actually close to the conversion share price. You have to actually sell your shares, okay? So that's pretty obvious. Now, the second point, sorry, the, uh, the first point here on the slide, which is less obvious, so, it is less obvious, so I have to spend a bit of time to discuss it. You see, if your conversion share price is based on, um, let's say, if today's our conversion day, if we base it on yesterday's closing price, then if I want to sell my shares today, it's fine. Because I don't believe that I'm that unlucky that it, yesterday they converted and today the share price plunged. Okay, so if I sell the shares today, I'll, pre I'll pretty much get some number close to yesterday's price. So that's fine. But what happens if the conversion share price is not based on yesterday's price? What if it's based on the previous 20 trading days price? It's some sort of average. Now, if it's an average, then if I want to sell, and if all these numbers are based on the past 20 days average, whether simple or volume weighted average, doesn't matter. It is some average of the past 20 days. If I were to sell my shares now, then the value that I'm getting is not reflected by these numbers. See, if the current share price is um, some number that's above the average conversion share price, is that good or bad? See, if all these numbers are based on some 20-day average, and if today's current share price, if I sell them now, if the price is above the average, is that good or bad to me? Oh, not good. <laughs> It has to be good news to me, right? Because I'm able to get, uh, I get the same number of shares based on the 20-day average conversion share price, but I'm actually selling them for a price that's above the average. So that's good news to me. But if today's share price happens to, be, happen to fall below the past 20 days average, that means that the amount that I'm able to get when I sell them will be less than this set of numbers because this set of numbers are based on the average. If today's price is less than the average, that means I'm getting less than what these numbers tell me otherwise. Okay? So there is still some risk there in that you might not get um, the worth if the conversion is based on 20-day average as opposed to yesterday's price. Okay? So there's a bit of risk there. It is not fixed. Um, yeah. okay? So take note of uh, those points as well. Now the uh, conversion is uh, now let, let's go through the. Uh, I didn't realize that the time is uh, almost up, but uh, we'll, we'll, I'll just spend a bit of time talking about the last slide. Okay, but before that, let me just quickly summarize all the key points about these uh, the two uh, um, sets of instruments. I'll ask you some simple questions, and please tell me the uh, they're, they're not that straightforward. Okay. Now, both instruments, convertible notes and converting preference shares, are very similar because they both turn into ordinary shares. So what's the difference? <laughs> With converting preference shares, they will convert into ordinary shares, whether you like it or not. But with convertible notes, the holder can actually choose to either redeem or convert. So with convertible notes, the outcome is uncertain, whereas with converting preference shares, yes, they will turn into ordinary shares. Okay, so that's, it's not as straightforward as saying that they will both turn into ordinary shares. Okay, so that's the key difference. Now, they both seem to give some sort of regular income in terms of either coupon payment or in terms of um, pre-specified um, dividend um, income to the investor. But you see, with the coupon payment, with the interest payments, those are compulsory. You have to make those interest payments or else you're in trouble. Whereas with the dividends, yes, they are pre-specified, but nothing's been said about us promising to actually pay. Okay, so there about lies the uh, key difference as well. Okay, so those are the two things. Okay, they, they seem to be quite similar, but the conditions that apply to them are very different. With the, the convertible notes, the conditions are a lot more stricter in terms of having to pay the interest, and also with conversion, it is not guaranteed. Okay, the holder can just choose to redeem and walk away. Okay. Now, the uh, very last slide here is just to uh, show you the uh, importance of, um, and I'll just take two minutes and then you can go to your tutorials already, okay? Now, what this is uh, trying to say is that um, the, the idea behind um, um, 
equity and debt holder is uh, one of the following, okay? Now imagine with this situation, See the if I can somehow if I can at least try to show you the uh, problem between equity holders and debt holders, then you can at least um, get some sense out of hybrid securities. Okay. Now, if assuming that we have a project that's equally funded by uh, equity holders and debt holders, so it's one million each uh, invested in these two million projects. There's two possible outcomes, and you should know this from two, uh, workshop uh, three. Okay. Success, failure. Now, if it's a success, then the firm is worth 10 million. If it's a failure, 0 0.5 million, okay? There's something left over. Now, if this happens, if you are equity holders and I'm, de I'm the debt holder, we each give uh, 1 million to start up this uh, company. If this happens, what will you actually do? Or, or what would normally happen if this is the case, if this is the outcome of the company in one year's time, two years' time, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> when the debt matures, The worth of the company is uh, 10 million. Well, when the debt, yeah, you would have to repay me my loan, which is 1 million, and you get to keep the company for yourself. So it's a VT minus X, which is 9 million, greater than zero. Well, easy enough. What about this situation? Anyone? And this will be the last question I'll ask for you. How do I express this in terms of BT and X? <laughs> I need to uh, be consistent here. Yeah, I know, but I have to for the rest of the class. What happens here is that the firm is actually technically bankrupt. You as equity holders, you're going to raise both your hands. You're going to declare yourself bankrupt. And the benefit to you is actually X. Why? Because you own me X. But you, you, you're declaring yourself bankrupt, so you can't repay me this. But what could you do instead? He said, oh, you know, I have no money for you. If you want, take this company. <laughs> and what is this company worth? VT. A VT amount that is less than X. And this is still positive or negative? What does this look like to you if I change this to ST minus X? This looks like the payoff of? What option? This looks like the payoff of a call option, and this looks like the payoff of a put option. You see, that's why there's a huge problem between equity holders and debt holders, because equity holders are actually option holders, and debt holders are at the mercy of equity holders. There's a lot of things that they can do to take advantage of uh, debt holders. But because of time, I can't I prepare all these uh, scenarios that I can't go through with you. But what I could at least say is that hybrid security is a means of appeasing that problem between equity holders and debt holders. You would only see a huge problem if it becomes highly leveraged. But you need to have that high leverage in terms of hybrid securities to then try to mitigate this potential problem. So that's the uh, real economic value of hybrid securities. Okay. Right, that's my last class, so uh, all the best for the exam. Uh, I've set my questions, no trick questions, okay? So uh, focus on the workshops, tutorials, and you'll be fine, okay? Thank you, everyone. Thank you.